so I think when we look at solidarity, we need to think about what it is that we think is important. And um, I think the one of the issues there is what injustice is. So for me, injustice is that normalization of the fact that the wealth of the wealthy stems from the poverty of the poor. And it's the normalization of the idea of some lives being more valuable than others. And so Pakistan and I mean, what's happening in Pakistan is just oh, mind blowing. Um, but Pakistan, Mozambique, South Africa, all the countries that are being worst affected by climate change are not the ones that are creating the climate crisis. That is what is unjust. Um, but we also have to think about what is unjust within our own movements. And the climate justice movement has been, um, has been very difficult for me re um, for a while, but also most recently a lot of the, the issues within our movement have come to fore with the war in Ukraine. There is quite a lot of racism within the climate movement, which is something that in the global south we feel. So, for example, since the war in Ukraine started, I got many emails from different collectives and groups urgently, demand, urgently calling on us to demand that Biden stops buying oil from Russia. I don't remember when last or if ever I received an email saying we urgently need to demand that Biden stops buying oil from Saudi or from Total, which has a, a, a Saudi prison in Total, which has a Saudi private Saudi prison in its gas site in Yemen that holds Yemeni prisoners for the Saudi government to interrogate and torture. We don't hear about this. What we do hear about it is when there are Christian white people who suddenly need help, okay? So what is unjust for me is the solidarity that we're choosing who, we're choosing who to, sh you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Northern activists are choosing who to show solidarity with. So why not put the same amount of love and energy and effort into welcoming refugees from countries who have been completely ravaged by wars that were based on fossil fuels, or refugees from cl climate refugees from countries who have because of because of floods, because of cyclones and earthquakes that are caused because of a crisis created by northern countries. Um, that is something I think we really need to to question, and this. This also goes to, we need to, when we talk about solidarity in climate justice movement, climate just, there's no climate justice without all justice. So we need to not be separating our fights. The fight for migration, for, for freedom of movement is the same, is not separate to the fight for climate justice. The fight against Zionism, the fight against racism, the fight for the, for the rights of women, they're not separate from climate justice. And the more we separate this, the more we keep the work, the work different, the more it pulls us apart. So I'll give you an example of South Africa. There have been communities fighting for their land in rural parts of South Africa for decades. There are fishing communities who have been fighting to, to, to be able to continue their, you know, way of sustaining themselves through fishing that they've been doing for generations. They do not call themselves the climate movement. The people who are getting lung cancer in Bitbank because of the Glencore coal mines, they do not call themselves the climate movement. I have never seen a single white person at any of those marches. I have never seen a white person at any of the marches for or the protests for toilets, for basic human necessities. Shell has now been planning on seismic drilling off the coast of Cape Town, there is going to be a big impact on the whales. The first time I've ever seen white people protesting has been against the shell seismic drilling because of how it's going to impact the whales. Can you imagine the hurt and the resentment that comes from activists who have literally been fighting for their livelihoods, for their 
continu continuation of existence when you've got the people who have power, the people who have access to the media, the people who have access to legal help, the people who are not going to go to jail for protesting, when they put so much of their time and energy into fighting for something that is not, when they put their time and energy not supporting people who really, really need support of the middle class and the wealthy. And in a country like South Africa, where the middle class and the wealthy and the white are treated as though their lives are more valuable, this is where it's imperative that white people use their privilege and their bodies to support other, other um, struggles. And this creates so much of a, of a, this is so polarizing in South Africa because when you talk about climate movement, people who have been fighting for toilets um, see this as something completely different. People who have been displaced because of the floods in Durban see this as something completely different. They see this as a middle class, white struggle for people who do not give any, I am trying to not say the word, but who do not give much about them. And that is heartbreaking because this climate struggle is about life. It's about sustaining livelihoods. And it's just been so, it's just been so polarized by race and by class. And it's heartbreaking to see because it could, it could be so strong if white people could actually just use the privileges that they have to support the struggle of the marginalized who are being affected by climate change. Um, so I think that is when. So I, I think one big part of solidarity is looking within ourselves as a movement. Um, the other is we need to make concessions for activists who do not have the privileges as Europeans do. When I, when I was in Denmark a few months ago, um, just consider that for me to get to Europe, in order for me to apply for, a, for me to get here for 10 minutes, I need to apply for a visa for which I need to submit um, three months of bank statements, a letter from my employer saying that they employ me, how much they pay me, three months of their bank statements, travel insurance. I need to purchase a flight. I need to show where I'm living and I need a letter from somebody inviting me. And then I just cross my, and then I pay 80 euros and I just cross my fingers that I get this visa, okay? So being here is not easy. And Northern activists, often take it for granted that we can travel as much as you can, and we can't, we are so limited. I was given a really hard time the last time I was in, I'll get to the Denmark thing, but um, the last time I was in Europe, I needed to go from Amsterdam to Paris. And I was only there for a certain amount of time because I only had a visa for a certain amount of time. And with South African RANs, I could only eat for a certain amount of time. And during this, it was part of a speaker's tour, and the trains were not working that weekend. And slow, I was gonna slow down. The trains were not working that weekend. And the only other, the, the other option was for me to take a bus or for me to fly. I'd been working 10 days straight, and I was gonna have another 10 days straight of work. And I had one day off. And the Northern activists insisted that I take a bus because their policy was not to fly. I totally understand that there is a responsibility that comes with being a Northern activist to do your part as an individual. However, you cannot put those same responsibilities on Southern activists because it would be a real, really sad if we are limited by a system that we are fighting against. And the, the guilt that got put on me because of this was, it was really shocking because it also just shows the lack of, often the lack of empathy and the lack of understanding and the lack of difficulty that even a middle class activist like me from the South has to deal with. Um, so I think making concessions is really important. And when I talk about the, my Denmark experience was being at this amazing radical left march on May Day. And I was doing a talk about the situation in Mozambique, which all Danish government pension funds invest in. And this is what we needed to talk about, was how the Danish public can actually make a difference. And 
didn't know that there were going to be opportunities to speak on the stage. And I asked, can I have a minute? And this was after you know, a lot of discussion about solidarity with the Global South. I asked, could I have a minute? And I was told, I'm sorry, we can't fit you into the schedule. That is not solidarity. Solidarity is adding a minute to your schedule to be able to have somebody talk and not you talk about us. Um, so, yeah, that is, and then I just want to go to the, what you said about the Greens telling people not to shower. So, <laughs> there's so much guilt that's placed by corporations and by those responsible for the crisis. There's so much guilt that they place on individuals and it helps for us not to be united in a struggle. But in South Africa, in Cape Town, there was a full-on drought, like a real drought for a summer. There was um, there were big billboards, like electronic billboards along the highway that said, five days to day zero, four days to day zero, and there was so much fear and panic created. And people had to stand, people would stand at the bottom of the mountain at springs waiting for to collect water. You only allowed five liters of water. People took more, physical fights would break out. If you took more than a two-minute uh, two shower, you would be judged. If you, the government told us you cannot take more than a two-minute shower, they said if you, um, if you pee, do not flush. And I remember going to public toilets, and if somebody went into the toilet and peed, and you knew that they peed because it was really quick, and then they flushed and came out, people would look at them like, oh, when... <laughs> What happened was there was a big increase in urinary tract infections because people were peeing on pee. So we should not have been fighting with each other like this. We are not responsible for, for, for the situation that we're trying to fight. We need to be more loving and gentle with each other um, in order to, to, strengthen, to strengthen the struggle. Not to, to fight, not to, it's not about being an individual, which is what the system has created. We need to rebuild that sense of community. And um, I think that's, that's what solidarity really is. It's, 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 using your, it's using your privilege to, uh, can I give an example? Me? <laughs> so the campaign that I coordinate is a really good example of how you can actually use your privilege. So the, the issue that we're dealing with is uh, the 20 $50 billion gas industry, liquid natural gas industry in Mozambique. And because of this industry, which has not actually started extracting yet, it's still in the construction phase, thousands of people have been displaced. A war has started between the military and insurgents who, since the beginning of this war, the government and Total and ExxonMobil and any the Italian company who's there refer to it as Islamic terrorism because this is... It's easy for them. They don't have to take responsibility. When Total, this was no surprise, Total sets itself up in places of conflict so that when things like this happen, because where the fossil fuel industry goes, conflict follows, when something like this happens, they can blame it on terrorism. So Total, as I mentioned about Yemen, they're in Yemen, they're on the... Um, they're in Mali and the Sahel, they've been in Myanmar, where they were the biggest revenue source for the junta, um, and they are now on the border of Tanzania and Mozambique. So it is very easy for them to say Muslim Brotherhood, ISIS, um, Al-Shabaab, because they then didn't have to take responsibility for the fact that they have created space for ex extremist narratives in a community that has been so neglected for so long and has now lost everything and is now seeing white European wealthy people, Mozambican political and economic elite coming and taking everything and leaving them to die. There are a million refugees that have been created. The climate impact is going to be massive. Just the construction of one LNG train is going to increase the greenhouse gas emissions of the whole of Mozambique by 14%. And th so the campaign is to get the gas industry out of Mozambique. Now, it's very difficult to lobby within Mozambique. The government is extremely repressive. People who have spoken out have disappeared. Journalists have disappeared, have been arrested with, without charge, have been tortured. And recently, the government um, created a new law called the terrorism law, which means that you cannot say anything about any militant attacks that have happened or you can be arrested. 
it's a very vague law, so we're still trying to analyze it because it's going to mean that we can't talk about what's actually happening to people. People who are being raped by the military because they want their compensation money, money that they receive from Total. People who are being extorted, they're being held hostage by the military. And when, the, when Total and the industry keeps trying to disconnect itself from this violence, they're lying. Total, even after it knew how the government, how the Mozambican army has been acting and treating human beings, they paid the government extra to deploy more soldiers just for them. And when there was this massive attack in Palma, which is the big, um, the biggest town in the gas region, so because of this attack, Total claimed force majeure, which is um, a clause in its contract with the government that says it can pause the project because it's a, it was an un um, force majeure is an unexpected event. It's an act, an act of God, basically. And they, um, they pulled, they put the project on pause, but this means they've stopped all their compensation payments. All the contracts that they had with small contractors, they've cut them off. They've stopped paying them. And during this attack in Palma, um, there were 800 soldiers protecting Total's site and only a handful protecting the community. So if Total and this, this industry, if the Italian government that is putting $2 billion into this industry and the UK government that is pulling a billion dollars, the US government, the South African government, if they say they have nothing to do with this violence and with this war, they are lying through their teeth and that is exactly what they are doing. They see Mozambicans as less valuable because they can get gas, they can get money, they can drink champagne and eat oysters in their ivory towers in Paris, while black Mozambicans and South Africans and people from the global south are dying every day for the wealthy to get wealthier. And this wealth stemming from the poverty of the poor. And we need to just bear in mind this bigger system, this bigger thing that we want to end as part of our solidarity. All lives mean the same, and this is what we have to keep in our minds when we're fighting for this, because we're fighting for everybody. Um, that's, that's what solidarity means to me. Mm -hmm.